Yep. All righty. I'm going to get started, and hopefully some of you will find a seat or a good corner to perch in and promise not to tell the fire marshal. We also have this, I hope, screening outside. There are a bunch of seats outside reserved for two panels, but we've got um, one of them are up here. So a few more seats down here. Please come and join me. Welcome, everyone. Um, Jared was just saying that the rumors that you heard that Taylor Swift was appearing this evening were misplaced. Um, but uh, in this crowd, I guess this is the equivalent of uh, uh, all-star celebrities. Um, I'm Sarah Rosenwortel. I have the great honor and privilege of being the president of the Urban Institute and to welcome you here this evening. Um, because we are trying to crush, ooh, not injure anyone, and uh, squeeze two big panels into the cocktail hour and get you home to families, let me say in advance that we're going to have uh, two segments to this evening's discussion. We are going to move from one to the other very rapidly with uh, only a... Um, uh, a quick break for the mics and a stretch your legs, but uh, lose, leave and you are at risk of losing your seat. Um, but we are not going to take Q&A at the end of, of each panel as we normally do in order to squeeze things in. But we invite you to join the conversation online by using the hashtag live at urban. Um, that's for both you, those of you in the room and those of you who are watching online. We welcome you as well. Please do join the conversation, share your observations, and we can continue the discussion uh, at the end of the evening. Um, I want to just say one word of thanks and express a moment of pride about the Housing Finance Policy Center here at Urban with its extraordinary team led by Lori Goodman and Alana McCargo. If you are not on their listserv, please make sure on your way you give us your card so you sign up. They sent an email around about their productivity last year, and it was somewhat mind-blowing with eight reports on home ownership, the most read being the one that says women are better at paying their mortgages than men. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, there were six reports on FHA, 11 reports on the general housing market, and a incubator with many of you in the room and others participating, talking about f ideas for the future of GSE reform, as well as a number that some of our fellows and experts published here today. Uh, it's an extraordinary record, uh, regular chart books and um, uh, sources of data, and most importantly, it's a community, and it turns out it's a big community of people who care about housing and housing finance. Um, and it's organized around evidence and, and, and the data, and we're so thrilled that you're all part of that community with us. Um, so today we're going to take up two related topics in turn. The first turns us back to a time eight years ago this month, in January of 2009, when incoming officials in the new Obama administration faced a uh, extraordinarily perilous housing market and general economy. At that point, it was still unclear if the Great Recession was going to prove to be the Great Depression, and housing was at the center of the storm, clearly both cause and effect of the crisis. So today we're going to hear two discussions. In our first, we're going to hear a discussion between the senior Obama administration officials, some who were there at the beginning and others who joined later in the administration, to talk about how they faced housing policy in the midst of and then coming out of the crisis. I should note that with the benefit of hindsight, they will share observations, but they speak only for themselves. Uh, only Antonio here is still an administration voice for the last few, uh, few more weeks. Um, others are all alums, uh, including our moderator. Um, uh, but so they speak for themselves and not the current president. And in our second segment, we're going to hear from housing market experts who have been on or have an ear of those on the other side of the aisle. Uh, these experts are also among those who we expect to have the ear of the incoming administration and Republicans in Congress, and some of them may in fact themselves serve. But also, that panel today are all here in their current professional capacity and share only their own observations about where the administration and congressional leadership may take us on these issues and in the years to come. 
I'm going to turn it over to Jim Parrott, who himself was both a HUD and NEC staffer in the Obama administration working on housing finance. Lucky we are to have him as a senior fellow and great team member at the Housing Finance Policy Center. And uh, let me just note that you all should have picked up as you came in the bio, so we're going to dispense with that and uh, make sure that we get to the matters at hand. Uh, please remember at the end of this, you can stretch your legs, but it's going to be a really quick scene change to the second panel. Again, thank you everybody for being part of the community and thanks for being here. Jim. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Thank you guys for coming. Um, a lot of the folks in this room and, and everybody up here, we've uh, participated in lots of panels that focus on the future, debates about where policy should take us, where the markets are headed. Um, but we thought that we would, with the first panel, do something a bit different and focus um, on the last eight years, sort of looking back over what we've been through um, as a nation, as an economy, and as, um, as policymakers. Um, really for two reasons. One is uh, there's a lot to be learned in looking backwards um, uh, as you think about what should come next. And two, uh, th there's just very little discussion about how policy is actually made. Um, very, mu very, not much of a, a look into what the process is like, um, how you wrestle with uh, the decisions you face as policymakers, what sort of pressures you're under, the trade-offs you have to make. And so I thought it would be useful to do a little bit of that um, uh, before we then pivot to looking to the future of the second panel. So with that, we've got a lot of folks here. Uh, as Sarah said, look at the CVs, uh, look at the bios for everybody's backgrounds. But um, you've got uh, folks who played in one uh, period or another senior roles in the administration uh, covering housing, and so we sort of cover the entire eight years, I'm pretty sure, from sort of day one to whatever the last day is, uh, eight times um, of the year. Um, so why don't we sort of go through a little bit chronologically, and Jared, let's, let's start with you. Um, remind me when you started with the vice president. Uh, I... Uh went to his house to talk to him about being his chief economist uh, shortly after the election. I remember that uh, Jill Biden had her ball gown on the table. I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, so it was right after the, uh, it would have been uh, in November. So of, right out of the gate. 2008, yeah. So part of the transition. And so you, so you guys, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I actually think the story begins, though, st though take me in a different place if this isn't where you want to go. Um, in mid-December, which was the very first meeting of the economics team uh, okay. in, um, in Chicago. Yeah. Uh, is that a good place yeah, to start? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so that was the very first meeting where we all came together, president-elect, vice president-elect, you know, Larry Summers, Christy Romer, Tim Geithner, <clears throat> David Axelrod, and you know, dark afternoon in Chicago, snowing, uh, as you'd expect. And we didn't know it at the time, but GDP in that quarter was contracting at an 8% rate. The technical term for that is nightmare. Uh, and uh, employment, uh, you know, there were 2.1 million jobs were lost in the first quarter of 2009. And it was widely recognized that the cause of, uh, uh, of the Great Recession had a lot to do with the imploding housing bubble. Um, and uh, the issues that that invoked for us were clear from the beginning. I mean, I just to throw out one number that was uh, germane at the time, one thing, uh, if you uh, kind of like a summary quick take on the impact of housing in the macro economies, you can look at residential investment as a share of GDP. And that wiggles between four and 6% kind of forever if you go back to, you know, as far as you want to go. And uh, in the housing bubble, it went up to almost 7%. And in the housing bust, which is when we met, it went down to oh, maybe 2.5%. So, so we knew that this was both a macro uh, a phenomena of, 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 uh, of, uh, of terrifying import, as well as a micro phenomena in, in terms of millions of people losing their homes through foreclosure and facing uh, uh, being underwater. So, that, so you walk into that pleasant, uh, <laughs> laid-back environment. Um, and how do you... How do you think about, in, this t in answering this, take me f through the transition into the early days of, of actually uh, decision making once you're in office. Um, how, do, how do you think about prioritizing the, the, the range of fires that are sort of going on all over uh, on many fronts? Um, how do you think about the relationship between the issues and then especially housing within that framework? Great, uh, you know, great, great, uh, great question. And 
exactly the one we said we'd talk about when we had our preliminary phone call, so that's <laughs> yeah. good. You're not supposed um, to tell. Oh, see. sorry. <laughs> uh, we prepared for this, folks. Um, I think to tee it up in a way that might be resonant for this audience in terms of answering your how do you think about this question, I'd be interested in, uh, Antonio, if this resonates uh, with you more as from your experience in financial markets, um, is you ask yourself, are we going through, so we recognized given the massive uh, demand side contraction, the importance of reflating credit markets and, and the, the drag from housing, as yeah. I just mentioned. And the question we kind of asked ourselves uh, I I I initially is, is, is this uh, from the perspective of, say, housing, f housing finance, but also from credit markets, is this an insolvency episode or is this an illiquidity episode? If it's an insolvency episode, that takes you down one path. If it's an illiquidity episode, which is what we believed it was, that takes you down another path. So uh, uh, from the perspective of the macro economy, we believe that the credit markets were uh, struck with uh, uh, an illiquidity episode having to do with non-performing loans and the, uh, in, and the intersection of, 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 of uh, systemically underpriced risk and this big demand contraction where millions of people were losing their jobs and their incomes. But at the same time, at the micro level, again, there's this macro-micro dynamic that's going on there that's really, really very um, uh, 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 important and, uh, to, uh, to understand the dynamics. Um, at the micro level, there's really an insolvency story where people simply couldn't afford to uh, sustain loans that they'd taken out once the price bubble burst. And so, at the one level, we're approaching this as, a, as an illiquidity crisis and pumping credit into the system. At another level, we're starting to convene groups, and you remember because you were <laughs> leading many of them, we're starting to be convene groups, maybe that came a little later, that we're trying to figure out how to deal with the uh, micro-insolvency problem, the fact that people were, were uh, um, uh, they're facing so many foreclosures. And here, and this is to me one of the big lessons learned, I'm looking at the title of the of the presentation today. This is one of the big lessons learned of the moment, and then I'll stop and you should move on to somebody else. <laughs> um, and, and that was that I, I, the, the moral hazard was in the room. Right. Moral hazard was, and, and so as a student of, of economics, there were all these things happening that you learned about in textbooks, but you didn't really think were such a big deal in the real world. So the zero lower bound was this problem that you read about. Well, turned out we were at the zero lower bound. Moral hazard is this idea that um, uh, uh, if, if you engage in policy that, uh, of, of the type we were contemplating, say for example, principal reduction, which looked to me like a very important part of the solution, um, the economists agreed on that point, and the politicos were saying, wait a second, wait a second. We can't go out there and sell a program where Mr. Jones, who partied you know, all day and bought two houses, is going to get all kinds of breaks. A boat, that was always the example. Oh, Mr. Yeah. Jones buys a boat, he doesn't buy a second house, he buys and, a boat. And, 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 and Mrs. Simpson across the street has been working her ass off at three jobs to pay off her mortgage. And so we would have, one of the first things I remember was having really good discussions in these economic meetings, these, these uh, you know, a level or two down below uh, the top uh, tier and then going to meetings that the political folks showed up on and they're like what the heck are you talking about and and it was pure moral hazard and the lesson I learned because I and I and I, I, I don't I, I think this is really important is that the time to worry at least from the perspective of the economy the macro economy but also the micro economy the lesson I learned was that the time to worry about moral hazard is not in the midst of the crisis. It's way before the crisis when you have to have a regulatory regime in place so that you don't face that moral hazard problem later on. Yeah, so That's it's probably the only useful thing I'm going to say today. So let me turn. No, that was good. So, so, but, but I, I think Tim, I think Secretary Geithner actually it says something like that in his in, in the chapter on this stuff in his book. He actually says something along the lines of, "We were so consumed with anxiety about the politics around moral hazard that." Uh, we often were, you know, too cautious by half um, in program design, which is a perfect segue <laughs> to, I'm just kidding, no. Um, so, so, uh, uh, so, Phyllis walks in the door not long after the, the table's been set, the, t the apocalyptic table's been set by Jared, um, and, uh, and, sh and you're running uh, the newly set up home preservation, home, uh, home ownership preservation office. You're the chief, the inaugural chief, I, I take it. Um, and, uh, 
And, and, and it's, in a sense, the, the organizational center for the flagship housing program to deal with much of the insolvency part of what Jared mentioned. So, so what was the mandate you were given walking in the door? What was the overarching, this is the problem you're, you're, you've got to go solve? And, and what were the limitations you had that were sort of built into that mandate? Well, I think first you heard Jared tee it up nicely, and that was we had a ton of economists saying you've got an insolvency problem, it's an illiquidity problem, it's big macro problems, but you guys got to get three to four million people through the servicing pipes and fix their mortgages, so go to it. So that's really where the setup was. But I think we were um, in many ways at Treasury at the time in the middle of 2009. You have to remember it was in the midst of the auto bailout, it was in the midst of AIG, it was in the midst of the large banks, and it was in the midst of community banks. So housing was there, and it was certainly a very big piece of our world, but it was really part of a just broader um, you know, economic policy through the, the TARP. But I think we had a, a, a couple things that were unique when it was set up. First, the housing piece was not a separately designed housing program. It was added on at the end of the TARP program saying, okay, well, if we're going to do all this for the banks, we are going to have a TARP for Main Street. So we came in with that, but the reality was we had to set up a retail program, which was very different for Treasury. Two, the restrictions on TARP meant you could only pay financial institutions. So you had to get a number of people to do things, but you only could use money um, for financial institutions. Three, it was voluntary because there was no legislative or statutory ability to modify loans. So you were playing with incentives. So you had to try to get the incentives right. And four, you had to use the existing servicing system that was in place to modify the mortgages. And for many of you in this room, no, it was not set up to modify mortgages. So that is really where where we started. But, but just let me stop you there. That's like so. The, we'll get to criticisms in a minute, but it's important <laughs> to stop you. <laughs> to say. No, we're not criticizing that. But, there but were a few. that we all face. That we all face. But 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 the the those three limiting factors. Um, you've got to pay financial institutions. Limiting by Congress, not like yes. internally limiting. But you've got to pay financial institutions. It's got to be optional. Um, and what was the third? Uh, you got to pay financial change. It's got to be optional, and you don't have any. You know, you don't have sticks. You have to use incentives to get people. Oh right, to right, yeah, them. yeah. So, so the, the is what we'll get into the criticism that we all were facing at the time. They were all in. The, with, they were all on the other side of that. They were all. Why don't you make them do it? Why are you paying them rather than just paying homeowners directly? But so many of them fell into the. Uh, the bucket of things we couldn't do legislatively, and we seemed in, inadequately prepared to explain that in a way that was at all compelling to the outside world that was criticizing it. But does that, does that seem I, fair? I think it's, well, not only is it, um, it, it's hard to explain, I think we spent a lot of time with those limitations because I think if you are in an economic policy shop and you look at the incentives, I think there was a view at the macro level, if you get the incentives right, people will take the offer. And so even with the, the HARP program, which many of you know was a, a refinance program, they thought, well, if you just tell people you can refinance your loan, they'll go and do it. And so understanding the consumer behavior and getting the incentives right and understanding what motivates people to open the mail, call their servicer, fill out paperwork, do all those things. Right. Whereas I think when they heard the program, they thought, oh, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and my mortgage is going to be lower and I'm going to be able to pay it and all is going to be well. So there was an education component that it, it took a, a long time for us to get right and we probably would not have gotten it right without the help of so many of the uh, consumer advocacy and housing advocacy organizations that really helped us along with Hope Now get that message out because we were just not equipped at the time for in, in in industry the third now that I mean, the third limitation that was so problematic as i recall was working within the existing infrastructure like we often were on the hill and whatnot people say why didn't you just set up a new why didn't you set up an agency that would buy all these distressed loans and do it yourselves as the government why do you have to rely on the banks that have just blown the world up as we know it um, but we were forced to work within the infrastructure that we had in place which we had all were all learning was inadequate to the job at that moment, servicing especially. You want to talk about that? Certainly, and I, before I talk about servicing, I think it's 
important to think back on that time. There was, you know, we had a $50 billion program and there was about $750 billion worth of negative equity in the system. So we, we could use all our money and not fix it. And of that ne negative equity, most of it was in five states. And so you can imagine the Hill if you took that much mm. money and just put it in five states. Right. So, so I think it's important just to remember that sheer dynamic of $50 billion for a program, $750 billion of negative equity. Yeah. Um, and that being said, you know, we had a, a servicing system that was set up for you know, the kind of you know, slow payment, you set it, kick the can down the road, extend it, hang up the phone, go out about your business. And suddenly you had a program that says, you've got to call in five days, you've got to do this, you've got to set up to pay incentives. It was hard for the system to work. Um, and then, as you mentioned, we were certainly criticized a lot, so we changed it a lot. So in the, you know, the tech one that says, you know, move fast and break things, we move fast, broke things, change things, move fast right. again. And it got yelled at <laughs> got at every stage at. of it, yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, so to the criticism part, so, um, the first two years, we were all under pretty withering criticism from um, various sectors about really whether or not uh, the, 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 the weapons we were deploying were nearly big enough and powerful enough given the size and scope of the nature of the crisis and the amount of suffering that it was generating. Um, and it came in the form of, do, you know, why don't we approach principal production more aggressively? Why doesn't HAMP work more effectively? I mean, it had a whole bunch of different forms, but the, the unifying theme was um, you know, you're, you're attacking this tidal wave with, with pencils. Well, let me just say that that's definitely true, yeah. but we were also getting flack from the other side. Does everybody yeah. know where the Tea Party came, the, the yeah, name right. of the Tea Party? I mean, this, this group would know. That's a good story, that's yeah. a good story. This yeah. group would know. I mean, it, it was from, I happened to be on TV in this little area of Pebble Beach when Rick Santelli went into that rant. That rant on CNBC. On CNBC, yeah. went, and, and, and that was about either Hamp or Harp. It was ham. It was ham. <laughs> because so, this is what they sent me that party. I still save that says, Honk, <laughs> I'm paying your mortgage. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah. That's so, great. so, you know, the incoming, the, the incoming was not just from people who said you weren't doing enough. Yeah, no, that's fair. You, we forget about yeah. that, that side. And, of I, think, and I think that's, that's the other part of it is, you know, yeah. we, we do think that we, in many ways, we were not doing enough. We could have a panel that comes after us that says, they did way too much, right. we're going to scale it back. All right, um, all right. so, so that, those are the first couple of years. Let me talk, let's talk a little bit about process and, and how these decisions were made. Um, uh, the the interagency process that throughout the eight years struggled with all these things um, and developed programs and modified the programs and, um, and defended the programs and the like uh, was a sort of White House, Treasury, HUD mix of offices uh, in which um, the NEC ran a process where the senior most folks from each of the relevant sort of housing shops in the administration, undersecretaries, secretaries, senior advisor, counselor types, uh, wrestled with these issues, tried to sort of define the nature of the problem, lay out options and a recommendation. We would then go to um, the principals, in this case the economic cabinet, um, so the Secretary of Treasury, HUD, Director of OMB and so forth. They would then um, think about it, come up with uh, a view, go to the president, and then he says, go, no go, uh, come back to the drawing board, or, or whatever his answer is. So um, an interesting piece of that, and, and Mike, I want to get your take on this, an interesting piece of that is you've got uh, a mix of very different institutions um, that, uh, that are brought around a table to make decisions together uh, in HUD, Treasury, and in the White House that bring very different skill sets, different backgrounds, different sort of cultural institutional histories. You worked at all three of them over your career. So at HUD and, and under Clinton and, um, and, and under uh, Treasury and, and the White House under this administration, how did those different personalities play out in this process? Was it challenging? Was it a positive mix of different yeah. skill sets? How do you think yeah, about that? Let me just, uh, on, on the points that we've been making, I joined Treasury in January of 2012, and the criticisms of HAMP were fierce, and the principal reduction argument continued to rage. And even though I wasn't there in my last, in, in Tim Geithner's last year, 
uh, in 2012, the end of 2012, uh, and I joined the beginning of that year, he invited back his, all his staff that had been associated with housing and asked them, besides thanking them and farewell, he asked them to think back, not knowing what you know now, but knowing what you knew then, would you have done anything different? And there was a robust conversation, but the only thing that they thought they could have done more about recognizing the politics of, the moral, of moral hazard and so on was cram down, was bankruptcy reform. Candidate yeah. Obama ran on, it. Yeah. ran on that. And when that bill came up, we did not use yeah. much political capital to push that. For it. And the feeling of many of his advisors there said that bankruptcy reform would have addressed as best as anything could have the moral hazard issue because it put you on a budget, it really required behavioral change and could have addressed that neighborhood issue, am I paying your mortgage kind of thing. And I think that's kind of interesting. And then the second thing, even when again in 2012 when I joined, um, I don't know who it was, but there are people in this room that would know that the four million. Oh gosh! I don't know where it was. That you, Jim? No, it's <laughs> before me. It's before me. <laughs> the notion that Hamp is going to serve four million households, we could never live down. And I don't know where that started, but I've got a good background story of that which which yes. so uh, a, a lender who I will not mention. Uh, 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 said to a policymaker on our team that I won't mention, uh, <laughs> said, you know, you've got this all backwards. You guys are, are trying to nail down the number that HAMP is going to serve, uh, and you ought to take credit for the number of, um, uh, of loans that are modified as a result of your restructuring the service sector. So you should take, the, the number you should be focused on is proprietary sure. mods plus HAMP, and, and the, the policy, the, uh, the, the, the person's response was basically, I don't trust what your mods are going to look like. Thank you very much. I'm going to stick with numbers for our mods. And if, if, if that policymaker had taken that, that banker's advice, yeah. um, uh, it would have changed the frame of, yeah. of how uh, we would have quantified and talked about yeah. success. I think. Uh, going back to your, uh, your question, um, Treasury, as Phyllis said, was not, is not a grant-making agency. It is really deep in analytical capability and expertise, but it had to really create a whole set of grant making offices and activities. And so that was done and it created a capability at Treasury in affordable housing that really I hope will last. If you move to HUD, HUD moves money, I mean, $45 billion a year budget, it moves money out the door. But it had to build up its policy chops to really engage and lead, particularly with FHA and my colleague on my left here, uh, stepping up and filling that liquidity uh, responsibility. And they built up their policy analysis chops. Go to the White House. How did I view the deputy process in 2012, 2013 when I joined? I, felt, I found it uh, a necessary process. <laughs> um, <laughs> Those were carefully spoken words. Hey guys, like. we're on TV. <laughs> I, I found it really, really helpful when I moved into your position in the White House <laughs> a couple of years later. Um, but this was really a CEA, NEC, HUD, Treasury, really, conversation. And the deputies process <coughs> includes a lot of others um, who uh, were not as, so we spent a lot of time on bilateral, <laughs> you know, kind of things meetings and trying, meetings, to, yeah. trying to get the White House okay on things. And, uh, you know, the White House would push you in areas that our lawyers would say you can't do. Um, and Never so succeed, for the record, if lawyers said we couldn't do it. Yeah. And uh, sometimes... <laughs> Get new lawyers. Sometimes, yeah. that's right, sometimes, you know, you find a way around, sometimes you don't. But 
uh, it was a, a challenge, you know, a very challenging process. But as you end up out of the other end, you now have capacity at Treasury and capacity at HUD that you didn't have before, and an ability to collaborate that may or may not be continued into the future, which obviously I hope it will be. The, sk the skill set contrast to the three buildings, I overgeneralized a little bit, was, um, it struck me as interesting because it was continuous through the different f teams that made their way through the wild. So, I, uh, HUD had, especially at the beginning of the crisis, or the beginning of the administration, um, they brought to the table an expertise around, with except, exception of Phyllis, an expertise around how industry actually works. And, and by industry, I mean the, the mortgage industry, not the capital market, not the secondary, the primary yeah. segment of the mortgage industry. Um, and, and it really was a useful complement to the capital markets, treasury folks, that had a, like a, a level of analytic chops that were, was exceptional, but they didn't have the same practical primary market skill set in, in wedding up uh, those two skill sets, it changed the way we all thought about what we should be uh, sort of trying to accomplish. And then the White House, frankly, has a much more political lens on things, which HUD wasn't always so great about applying, and frankly, Treasury wasn't always so great about applying. So at its best, it seemed like a good mix. At its worst, you had tensions because people were solving for different problems. and. Uh, and the like. Um, so I would just say at its best, it's something that I think, I wish if I looking back, we should have started it earlier in housing because once it got started, the treasury was able to scale up its um, retail yeah. understanding. Yep. And I think HUD was able to understand much more about how policies impacted the global markets. And it was something that, yeah, you know, right. I think once we got that going, it was better, but in the early days, we had individual agencies saying, I don't like what Treasury's doing. I'm going to do my own modification and housing policy this way. So you had, you know, ag lending yeah, right. one way. Well, you had we, states going another We had some Treasury way. management to do. We'd show up at deputies meetings, and Treasury would bring three times as many people as anybody else, <laughs> and they would disagree with each other. You'd have, like, the econ <laughs> policy people. It's all right, so what does everybody think about, should we, go to, we should do option one, two, or three, and HUD would say one, and... Treasury A would say two, and Treasury B would say three. I'm like, wait, you don't get two votes. <laughs> so, so eventually we had to work work through some Treasury management issues and shrinking the shrinking. representation among, it's intimidating for HUD comes in with two people and you've got like a whole floor of the Treasury Department. It's very unnerving. Sorry, so 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 I don't run out of time. So so Carol, pivoting, you and to some degree Phyllis, um, you, you had to run a program, not just think about policy, right? The rest of us, Got to, got to sort of think about what the right policy paths forward were. We got to debate about um, options one, two, and three, and so forth. You had to go back uh, at HUD to HUD at the end of one of these meetings and actually run a business. H how did those two hats complement each other? How did how did they affect each other? Were they was it a struggle uh, to manage both? Yeah. So I mean, I would just say that um, we felt like we were actually the you know a major implementation arm of policy. Um, and, I th and I think we were both in the multifamily and the single family at FHA. And so you couldn't really um, do that without being involved in the policy conversation enough to make sure that you're aligning with uh, generalized views. Um, but the other challenge with that policy uh, versus implementation is that, uh, you know, Phyllis was talking about uh, what she could and couldn't do under statutory authority. Well, FHA has different statutory authority than the TARP programs, and so you wanted to try to align, like say, take uh, the conversation we had on, on reps and warranties, right? You know, you wanted to try to align what, you know, you wanted Fannie and Freddie to do uh, you wanted FHA to do the same thing, but guess what? We don't really have the same authority to do that. So how do you get it, you know, uh, similar but not exactly the same? And that's a lot of work then that has to go back to the HUD team to try to figure out how do we do that. And you're doing that on multiple, multiple issues. So managing the expectations, frankly, of Jim Parrott and you know those uh, of the White House about what was possible in terms of FHA's contribution to the broader um, agenda uh, was a challenge. The other thing I would say is that um, just you know I did start in May of '09, so I was there pretty much from the beginning. 
Um, but I started with the multifamily. So I, I was only involved in the deputies process when on the rare occasion the deputies would decide to actually talk about multifamily, um, <clears throat> which was a bit of a problem uh, since that market was also, you know, maybe not as systematically at risk, but it was certainly uh, a risk for communities and, and for borrowers. And I was over here managing FHA multifamily that was going from $3 billion a year of uh, volume to uh, the peak in 2013 of 17 billion because there were no other, you know, CMBS was a mess. Uh, and so, you know, we really had a scale uh, with no new money, no new people, uh, and, you know, all these expectations that, you know, we were the only man standing to, you know, uh, uh, provide that kind of liquidity. So uh, you're doing that. And, and then when I moved over to the single family side, uh, you, you know, it was the same kind of story it, with, in spades where we were really expected to um, make a lot of change quickly, very creaky systems, uh, statutory requirements uh, that just, you know, don't, don't get you nimble very quickly. And there's, you say, well, I, I could do that, but I'm going to need $2 million to make a systems in change. In 18 months. You know, and it's kind of like, well, you know, you just got your budget cut. We're on sequestration, and there's, you know, you're, you're, there's no money for IT changes. So th those implementation challenges to meet the policy goals were uh, a, a real uh, dance. But I think, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm quite proud of what uh, FHA accomplished. I'm very <coughs> proud of the team that stepped up and, uh, you know, did really hard policy work and hard implementation. We didn't get all the way to the places we ultimately would have w wanted to go, but um, we got pretty far. Yeah, it's come a long way in, in eight years, especially the pressure that it was under um, as sort of we, as you guys all walked in the door in 2009, yeah. um, I mean, it was bearing a huge burden of yeah. the collapsing. Yeah. If I can make, can I just make yeah, another sure, comment sure. about the deputies process? Yeah, yeah. Because only if it's uh, positive. Yeah, you know, it's, it's <laughs> well, it's not actually positive, but it's, not, <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny. Which is um, one of the challenges. So I think it was a really important, important process to have, and I really do hope that kind of capacity and cross uh, collaboration remains. But one of my frustrations is someone who started in '09 and left at the end of '14. So I was there, you know, five and a half years. Um, is there was a lot of changeover in the people involved in that process. And I'll never forget one meeting where a new economist comes in. We're talking about multifamily for the first time, and we're, for the first time in about, you know, two years. <laughs> and um, a great guy became someone I really like, love and respect. But his first thing out of his mouth was, what is the theory of the case for government involvement yeah. in multifamily? And uh, <coughs> it just I, dials back. I thought I was going to like jump out of my chair and throttle him. And 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 Mike <laughs> is sitting kind of category to me. And you know, if looks could kill, he just looked at me like, "Down, girl, I got this." <laughs> you know, <laughs> from one academic to another, I'm going to handle this. And I just went, "Okay," and he did. But, it, but it, so, the, so there was a CA, um, they, it, what was interesting to me about CA is they had such continuity in the way that they came at the it, very helpful uh, framework within which to view things. But, but you had to, you're right, with each, and the CA is, has a structural um, iterative issue, which is that they come in for a year and then they, they leave just by design. And so whenever the new CA person would come in, like, why do we need a government guarantee and explain this whole 30 year fixed? Well, why do we even need, you know, so you go through the whole, you know, process. And it was really helpful the first couple of times because it's good <laughs> to like practice it. But you get to the third or fourth time and you're just like, out. yeah, <laughs> right, just here, take the flyer. But, but to their credit, they, they like, they. Are, they are consistent. They, yeah, they're consistent, that's right. But, but they, they moved up the learning curve for a lot, and for a lot of them, they weren't housing finance yeah, people right. per se. Uh, so they're just brilliant, you know, Nobel-like economists uh, for you know, trade issues. One useful thing I found is to get them 15 minutes with Joe Biden. That, that, yeah, that right. was very yeah, effective. Yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> talk about, the, you know, we, All right, so we have a fixed rate mortgage? Let's, uh, speaking of um, issues that we uh, have dealt with, dealt with over the whole eight years, one of the common threads that everybody up here um, uh, has, uh, struggled with, thought about is GSC reform. We've all, if we added up the hours of meetings that, how many of us are there, six of us? Six of us have sat through deliberating about GSC reform 
uh, both on the inside and then since, um, uh, it's hard imagining that we spent more time thinking about sort of over the course of the whole eight years. Um, Antonio, this is, this is, br we'll bring it forward to the, the current uh, time. You guys have uh, come out with a couple of papers um, that really, uh, for the first time since the 2011 white paper, talk through how the administration thinks about reform, where you think it should go. Um, so why now? We're about, you're about to walk out the door. Like, what, what, what do you hope to accomplish by sort of putting down a marker for how the administration thinks about these things? Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, we, we uh, when I arrived in 2014, uh, we had meetings with many of you here uh, with a variety of stakeholders. And um, it was actually Lori Goodman here in the first row, I remember in a meeting who looked up at us and she's ever the optimist on GSE reform <laughs> <as> <laughs> yeah. we later. She said, can't you guys just focus on programs <laughs> and, and not on the GSEs? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what we really did was uh, uh, we did focus on programs, and I'm so happy the team uh, led by Mark McArdle is here, but uh, we focused on four areas. I'll tick them off, then I'll answer the GSE question. The first was uh, we were able to obtain from the Congress a reallocation of appropriations from HAMP, which we sunset early into the hardest hit funds of $2 billion, which went directly to help struggling homeowners in the hardest hit states. That money uh, by Mark and his team was at the door uh, by May of the year following the appropriation mm -hmm. and will flow uh, for the next three years. Second, there is a program on multifamily uh, between the Federal Financing Bank and HUD, which is the risk share program which is now up to 12 states and about a billion dollars uh, and more than 7,000 units of affordable uh, rental stock, uh, which would not exist but for this program which they have led. Third, uh, after Director Watt opened up the trust funds, uh, we focused on getting the capital magnet fund out and dispersed, and that will, and that will, and that will get to just under a billion dollars of purchasing power through the uh, CDFIs. And then last, uh, all of the servicing improvements which have been discussed, uh, we worked very hard with HUD uh, and with um, uh, the FHFA in order to present a white paper on life after HAMP so that the early sunset would not come at the cost of the improvements which had been made at servicing. And, uh, and I think industry in general has taken on board this concept uh, thus far. So from a pragmatic standpoint, we benefited enormously in these last two years from all of the trial and error and the work that had been done in order to really focus and center on the homeowner and the renter. So the GSEs, um, I've said before, and uh, I still believe it to be the case, that it is the, the great unfinished business of financial reform, I think all of us would agree with that. Um, and uh, when, we, when I arrived in 2014, it was also absolutely dead on the Hill. There was no appetite from either uh, Republicans or Democrats to launch a full-blown reimagining of the housing finance system uh, in these last two years. And so, but what we did think would be useful would be to express in a few uh, written statements, which we have put out, what our high-level thoughts about this are. Now, you all have proposed, you know, 18 or 20 different housing finance systems, um, <laughs> you know, and, and I think Urban is sort of cranking them out once a week or uh, thereabouts. So we, we, didn't dis we didn't throw our hat in that particular <coughs> ring. Um, but what we did say was, okay, how do, you, how do you think about it? And what's a useful framework to think about it? And, uh, you know, Jared said early on on the underwater issue, the underwater issue is still with us. Estimates uh, vary between 7 million plus if you look at CoreLogic and 12 million if you look at Zillow or thereabouts. And so these are, these are real um, locked in homeowners, but there's a more important figure, I think, which is that all of us know or have family members who are locked in 
in terms of their labor market mobility, their social mobility, their life mobility by our current housing finance system. And there are tens of millions of Americans who do not have access to appropriate housing. And I think that one of the difficulties of the housing finance system discussion is that it is so arcane, and there are about a dozen people in this room who actually understand the vocabulary of it, that you really have to come back to firsts. And firsts are, how do you get for Americans the most out of our current housing finance system? Because every American, particularly today under conservatorship, whether they know it or not, is a participant in the housing finance system. Because the housing finance system today benefits not just from the $187 billion of capital that were infused at the time of HERA, but from the $258 billion ongoing backstop that remains in place for which every taxpayer is responsible. And so I think it goes to reason that, you know, once you've convinced the economists that you need you need the government in the housing finance market for the 30-year, for the TBA market, for access, for a whole host of reasons, that it is also the case that you want that housing finance system to serve everyone. And so where we have fallen short, I think, is that we have the GSEs some 10 years on still in conservatorship, the taxpayers still uh, exposed to the GSEs, and yet um, the GSEs are serving a fairly pristine credit quality of uh, profile, both for, both for primarily for buying, but also for, for renting. And the average FICO score is in the area of 750. Um, and so if you have a pristine credit score and a robust uh, credit history, you, you can be served by the GSEs. <coughs> But notwithstanding the very significant efforts of Director Watt and his team in promulgating a duty to serve and working on housing goals, it is still the case that for many Americans, I mean, 40% of uh, mortgage applications are below 700 in FICO score, and many of those are responsible borrowers and would be renters, uh, there is nowhere to go. And so we have a major sort of direct and indirect locked in effect in the economy, and we also have a suboptimized sort of government role in the housing finance system. So it leaves us uh, with having de-risked the two institutions substantially, with a whole host of financial reforms around qualified mortgages, around prudential oversight, having probably de-risked some of the abusive underwriting practices that were taking place in the lead up to the crisis but with a taxpayer exposure to a housing finance system which is not broadly serving everyone, and we all know it in this room. And, and so the papers are really just a way of reminding us of that, of saying what's at stake, of saying that we want a housing finance system that's going to serve the borrower and serve the renter that fairly. And so we're simply putting that frame out. And whether that takes the form of one fit system or another, you know, it's our belief with the benefit of the work that's been done uh, throughout the administration that the future system should, should square up well against those criteria. So how do you, given what you just laid out, um, what do you think the odds look and feel like as you guys walk out the door Guys, the next week. You know, so, so the first answer is I have no clue. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and 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 there are other people in this room who are far more knowledgeable than I am on that question, including my alleged affairs colleague in the front row. Um, well, what I can say is that you know there's a lot of talk about an accounting draw. I don't want to reopen the entire polemic around an accounting draw. Uh, but it is the case that the GSEs have $55 billion in deferred tax assets on a combined basis, and that is at a 35% domestic statutory tax rate. So it is also the case that if there is tax reform, business tax reform, that reduces that 35% statutory tax rate to some lower number, whatever that is, whether it's 15, 20, or 25%, 
that those deferred tax assets will have to be written down to reflect the loss of the future tax shield that the higher rate would have provided, and that there will therefore be a uh, draw to the extent of the write down. Um, so, uh, and that's not just true for DTAs held by Fannie and Freddie, it's true for DTAs held by industrial companies, for financial companies, all, the, all around, all around uh, the economy. Um, so, uh, it's just, a, it's just an issue that future policymakers will have to manage because what it, what, it, what, it, what it will do, in effect, is just to remind the taxpayer, <coughs> remind the taxpayer that the taxpayer is on the hook. And when you're talking about a $55 billion asset, any significant change in tax rate should, should result in, in a significant draw as well. And administrative reform, so, so you've got um, to your implied point, um, the politics of this can turn on a dime and it could change the probabilities of legislative action pretty significantly. And a draw, is, depending on the size and the context, could be one of those triggers. Um, uh, you're someone, like some others up here, who understands um, what administrative reform might, might not look like uh, better than most. And you hear a lot of uh, commentary about the possibility of administrative reform, especially given the Treasury designates comments about reprivatizing Fannie and Freddie and what people drew from those comments. Um, thoughts about what the likelihood, constraints, flexibility might and look like I think, there? I think like everyone here, we believe that the best housing finance system and the most durable, sustainable housing finance system is accomplished through comprehensive legislation, comprehensive reform. and. Uh, uh, with respect to the administrative question, uh, I, I, I really couldn't speculate on what might come, but uh, I did mention the $258 billion backstop, which remains in place. And I think most uh, housing finance systems would like to see that many would like to see it migrate onto the securities level, the guarantee. Um, but at the moment, that exists at the level of Fannie and Freddie. And $258 billion uh, under any administrative proposal remains in place. So the taxpayer remains fully behind the two entities. The credit markets rely on that. And the pricing of that backstop is a complex matter. But one thing I would say is that in the event that one were to pursue administrative reform, A, but in our judgment, would not constitute reform, not in the sense in which we were discussing it before, but B, the taxpayer needs to be fully compensated in for that $258 billion backstop, which unlike a standby credit agreement, is a standby equity agreement. And so whatever dollar is infused goes immediately to the bottom of the capital structure. And so the pricing of that is a non-trivial matter and the level of that PCF, which has been waived since HERA has started. The commitment fee. It, it, sorry, the periodic commitment fee uh, is, uh, is, is something that requires really careful and full analysis. Yeah, I mean, Jared? The only thing I would want to add is, as, as an out, a, a former insider on the outside now, looking in and occasionally getting to talk to some of the folks on the inside about this, is that the, the, the current situation from the incoming administration feels a little bit analogous to the Obamacare situation, where, where you, know, you, you have the president-elect saying, we got this terrific replacement, but I don't think he really has a, a, a replacement or a terrific replacement at all, and just saying, just saying that because that's what um, he wants people to hear. And I'm not saying that um, other incoming officials are doing the same thing with, uh, with the GSEs, but there is an element of um, we want to have a great system and we're going to have a great system and it just means ending conservatorship and we can kind of do it like this. Where if you actually talk to the folks, uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think that's right and I think the complexities that Antonio just went through are real and nobody uh, knows uh, uh, with certainty how to solve them and the different um, channels of activity on the Hill are all kind of going in 
uh, in, in, in different directions. And I think one problem we face is that there are a lot of high-ranking officials within at least uh, this government, and I expect the next government as well, who kind of think the system is basically okay the way it is. Eventually, yes, we have to fix the, the, the agencies, but it's, it's sort of percolating along okay. But then when you hear Antonio talk about the credit constraints, you realize, in fact, it's really not percolating uh, uh, okay. And if you look at that indicator I mentioned, uh, the contribution of residential housing to the investment side of the GDP accounts, it's still depressed. I mean, it's coming back up, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's, not, uh, it's still well below its, its historical average. So other comments on, on GSE reform before we go to final thoughts, yeah? Just uh, two things. One is on the deferred tax asset, um, a similar rate reduction uh, has profound effects as well on the low-income housing tax yeah. credit. And, and so these issues are going to permeate through the affordable um, uh, housing uh, activities of, of, of all kind. Uh, are you going to close with... Well, I was going to get, so yeah, so close, closing so, comments. Well, let me at least yeah. ask the closing question, and then you can, <laughs> yeah. So see Sarah's over there doing the wrap-up wrap thing. So, so from each of you guys, if you could, um, a quick comment about um, uh, how you want the administration to be remembered on housing, um, <laughs> and if you have interest in it, um, a, a frustration, a lingering frustration, things where you wish we'd gone right when we went left, but that's optional. But definitely, like a the positive thing you got to do. That's required. The negative thing's up to you. Phyllis, you start. Well, the the positive thing, and I'll I'll, I'll speak to um, Hamp just because that was where I spent most of my time. Is that regardless of whether people love it or hate it, it has fundamentally changed the game for modifications. And however you look at it, it'll be either Hamp plus or Hamp minus. But it it, it did become a household word. That's good. That's good. Uh, All right, oh, Jared. You know, um, <clears throat> Carol uh, may, may or may not agree, but the only positive thing I can think of right now is... Um, mm. is only positive. Well, the, one of the positive things <laughs> I can, I'll, I'll wait till the others go and then I'll have more. Um, is uh, I think eventually we did start to take multifamily a lot more seriously, yes. and, and I think that's just super important. Um, you know, I guess the, I'll just reiterate. Um, the time to worry about moral hazard is not when the S is hitting the fan. It's way before, and that's why you, 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 you need to have, when, when, when people talk about regulation as, as all downside, just remember that the next time you're in the midst of a crisis and everybody's saying, don't do that, that's moral hazard. I think the um, Treasury saved the housing finance agencies and that whole structure, one of the most successful programs uh, was to provide liquidity to housing finance agencies and they have rebuilt and, and continue to be major partners and Treasury is now really connected in a way that I think is going to be very helpful on affordable housing going, going forward. Uh, my f biggest frustration is it's the path not taken. Um, I came to Treasury on a one year, it was supposed to be a one year appointment to develop a comprehensive plan for housing finance reform for Tim Geithner and Mary Miller who uh, said, you know, this is time in 2012. We delivered that plan to Secretary Geithner in December. Um, it was uh, not only uh, GSE reform, uh, we worked very hard with HUD and it included FHA reform, it included uh, federal house home loan bank reform, and the decision ultimately was made by Secretary Geithner and uh, to leave it for Secretary Liu, um, and the decision was that this would be a target if we put out a comprehensive vision at that time in 2013. And so the decision was to help with Corker Warner and then, you know, and, and so whether or not a blueprint for the Obama administration early on would have led to different results, who knows? All right, Carol. Yeah, just quickly, I would say my, my biggest regret is that given that we were in, you know, this crisis mode for most of the time, really all the time that I was here, and I think we did 
just incredible work to save the markets and to save you know people and places from worse disasters than uh, you know than otherwise would be, uh, and so that's really positive. I feel like we never um, we didn't lose sight of that you know people and place and the and the things that we needed to do there. So I feel very good about that. Um, at the same time, you know, I never feel satisfied, you know, as the Hamilton play would say, uh, there's lots of things we didn't get to, uh, and there's, a, you know, there's some regret there. And Antonio? I'd say to be remembered, the last team, by the extraordinary heart the, and effort and creativity that the programmatic teams led by Mark have put into it, and uh, I have every confidence that the staff uh, throughout from Monique Rollins and Sam and all of the successors to you all uh, will not leave this issue behind. And I think that this issue will remain as important to all of uh, the staff as citizens as it has uh, for them as sitting officials. So two, two, two things. One, I'll start, I'll start with the negative and finish with the positive and do it quickly. Um, uh, on, the, on the negative side, which a lot of you guys have brought up, I, the, the lack of um, closure on GSC reform as, as we leave is, is a fr residual frustration for me. I'm not sure how we could have played it differently in a way that would have um, necessarily brought the right kind of closure, but um, the, in the absence of more aggressive leadership um, at the highest level, which we uh, decided not to pursue for entirely reasonable, practical, political reasons, but the lack of leadership um, uh, and, in, and in the, at the highest levels in Congress as well, to me has left a bit of a vacuum um, that uh, some pretty divisive voices have filled, mm -hmm. uh, really deteriorating the quality of the dialogue here in a way that is, um, has not served uh, the nation of this conversation very well. So that's the biggest regret. Po the biggest positive, um, two things. One, uh, I think if you, if, if you look back 20 years from now, I think people will appreciate um, the degree to which the administration, uh, frankly, saved the, the economy from an abyss. And I think housing was central to that. Uh, and then secondly, um, I, th I think, I hope, um, that we were able to put housing finance at the center of a more mature discussion about economics and finance uh, and financial policy generally, which I'm not sure we saw as much of. 10, 15, 20 years ago. Hopefully that's something that, uh, that remains behind. So anyway, that, thanks the panelists. Yeah, let me just say thank the audience. Oh yeah, thank yeah. the audience. Yeah. So please join me in thanking them and as they get up and we grab our mics uh, to the panelists, please come on down. You can stretch your legs, but we're gonna keep going straight on. So uh, please stay in the vicinity.
If you could please find your seat. Are you going to live tweet this? So for those of you, am I open? So for those of you in the business of prognostication, this is our equivalent of the Taylor Swift panel. <laughs> so why don't we grab a snack and grab some seats. There are lots of seats down front. We have a promise to get you all home uh, on time. So thank you, everyone, for staying with us. Um, and uh, I want to repeat my uh, disclaimer at the beginning of the evening for those who've joined us late. Uh, we have a wonderful group of uh, experts here today who are important voices on uh, housing reform of a variety of kinds. Uh, they speak each for themselves. Uh, I think you all have their bios, but I'll just briefly mention Michael Bright, former uh, staffer to Senator Corker, in which many of us have gotten to know him in that role, and currently director of the Milken Institute's Center for Financial Markets, where he leads their housing program. Mark Calabria, who's the director of financial regulation studies at the Cato Institute. Sean Krauss, who's an executive vice president at Quicken Loans. Uh, and Rick Lazio, who's a former four-term member of the U.S. House of Representatives, where he chaired the Housing Subcommittee of the Financial Services Committee. Uh, currently, Rick leads Jones Walker's housing and housing finance industry team. Uh, and for those of you who are expecting Tim Rood, he sends his regrets. He had a last-minute scheduling conflict and was unable to be with us. Um, so uh, I actually think we ended the last discussion at a good place to move here. Um, I will make a, a moderator's prerogative observation, having served in uh, the Clinton administration, that each administration um, develops what I like to call its own jurisprudence. That those, we heard discussion about the very early days and the deputies' meetings and the conversations that happened between principals. And it took a while for people to get to know one another, to get to know one another's perspectives. And so, obviously not small decisions, but each decision took a lot of deliberation to get to. And as administrations evolve and their relationship with the Hill evolves and everyone gets to know one another over time, uh, decision making becomes more rapid in part because the frame of reference, the choices narrow, or at least people know where each other are coming from. So we have an incoming administration and leadership on Capitol Hill that have to go through that process. Um, and they're going to go through that, but with also uh, having created some expectations about alacrity. And I thought we would start um, with uh, a, a brief conversation where the last one ended um, about uh, GSE reform. Um, and I think I'm going to, uh, both Michael and Rick, ask you to uh, share some observations. Anyone else is welcome to, to share thoughts as well. Um, uh, generally speaking, on many policy issues, you know, if we're talking about health care, you generally know where each party is coming from. But on uh, reform issues around housing finance, it's not as simple as a left-right divide. Um, there really are different strands of thought, and so this process of getting to know one another and learning where people are coming from who are going to be key decision makers is a crucial one. Rick, why don't you start if you would, sort of, what are some of the big strands of thought in this debate that are likely to be being uh, fleshed out and observed amongst decision makers, both on the Hill and in the incoming administration, around the future of the GSEs and what this system should look like? I say my, my first point would be that there's a fairly wide diversity of thought among Republicans that ranges from maintaining the federal guarantee as it exists right now uh, the status of the entity, the successor to Fannie and Freddie, whether it's a mutual, whether it's a private entity, or whether it stays in public hands. Uh, but there are certain things that are pretty universal, I think, I think are universal, which is that virtually all Republicans believe in a replacement model for the current structure. Um, I think the two areas which are the heart of the matter are 
the uh, status of the entity. Is it, does it stay within the government or is it s somehow either a mutual or, or spun off and recapitalized as a private? And will there be a federal guarantee or as some very important policymakers believe that the system can be developed without having a federal backstop? And so those two, I mean, the rest of it is in terms of the platform, um, the multifamily business, uh, you know, there's, there, there are dozens of different sub-issues, but I think those two, to me, are the two pillars of where there, if there was to be an agreement, that there has to be consensus among key Republicans. Again, diversity of thinking is interesting, but what really matters are the people that can have the authority to actually make key decisions. Um, and uh, Michael, I'll turn to you and then ask each of you to also share thoughts about the prognosis for that consensus building process. And is this early in a new administration that we might uh, see some of that uh, coming together around thoughts likely to happen? Or do we perhaps need to wait some time for that uh, getting to know one another dance to go happen? Um, well, I certainly hope it doesn't happen too quickly because then we wouldn't get to do these GSE reform panels <laughs> and sessions. We'd be but, out of work, and right? I would, I would miss everyone in this room who I kind of know. I promise you I'm happy to find some other stuff to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being sarcastic, of course. I think we'd all like to move on with our lives uh, in some <laughs> regard, or at least make uh, – it'd be great if at some point soon when we're doing these sessions it's about – uh, the complexities and the challenges of implementation of a new system as opposed to this sort of uh, <laughs> theoretical exercise of what should happen. Um, I do want to thank the previous panel. Between the financial crisis and GSE reform, I don't know which one gives me more PTSD, but we got to relive both of them. <laughs> in, in <laughs> so I hope it was cathartic for them. <laughs> I need a Xanax. <laughs> but, uh, um, I, Look, I think in terms of reasons for optimism in term and moving this uh, uh, relatively quickly, I, I would say that uh, there has been a lot of education in town, especially on the Hill. I'll speak for the Hill um, on this issue. I mean, I think when I started in Capitol Hill in 2010, um, people didn't know where they wanted to be on this issue, and they were they, we were trapped in a lot of very sort of rigid ideological discussions. And, and it's, it's, it's Washington, it's Capitol Hill, we're never gonna completely move away from rhetoric and ideology. But um, I have seen United States senators in a room using the word convexity accurately <laughs> in a sentence, <laughs> which I always took as an example of success that we had at a minimum figured out how to elevate the discussion in this town. And I do think that that's happened. And so I think that um, if the stars are aligning uh, I think the stars are aligning because it's time to do this and everybody really wants to do it. And uh, some, of the, some of the points that were made on the previous panel, which is there, there, we, don't, we do have too tight of a credit box. There, we do have um, uncertainty in terms of what the future of the system is. We do have all these problems that we need resolved. And there's a, there's a, uh, when you sit down with members now, um, they're leaning forward and one of the things I've noticed is they're actually playing devil's advocate and asking the other side because they really want to understand what would trip this up because if I take this on and I push what you're doing, you know, who's going to be in my way? And this is from members on all political, all sides of the political spectrum. So you can feel a desire to do it. And then the other point is, like I said, the, the education has, has taken place, I think, to, to a great degree. So um, we have a fundamental base off which we can build. It's going to take some leadership. Um, it's going to take a secretary of the treasury or a, design, a very senior designee to go on television and sell it, um, to sell it to the American people, to explain it to the American people why this matters. That's a critical thing to getting this done. But I think with that push, you know, the, the pieces may be in place. So Mark, um, if you wouldn't mind, are we, do you think that um, we, we had a secretary designate who, whether he intended to or not, uh, certainly uh, provoked a lot of interest in uh, the prospect for moving this forward uh, when he uh, made a relatively cryptic remark about the, or maybe not, about the Fannie and Freddie. Do you think the likelihood of that leadership coming from the Treasury Department is significant and do you have a glimmer of, 
of sort of substantively what that might look like? So let me first pivot off of what Michael said. Uh, I don't think this gets done without an engaged commitment from Treasury or White House. Uh, one reason of which is I see zero reason why Mitch McConnell would spend a second of Senate floor time on this, given how it divides the caucus, which I'll get to in a second. So the only reason you really get McConnell to give this any floor time, which, which is the, as we know, on a lot of number of issues, the binding constraint in Washington, um, that you need a secretary, you need a White House to go to McConnell and say, we prioritize this. Because I can say as a, as a former staffer watching the chairman you know, say, please, please give us floor time. It didn't work for us. So, uh, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I, you know, as much as I like Mike Crapo, I don't think he's going to be any more convincing with McConnell on that. But that said, to, you know, my interpretation of, um, maybe I'll start with explaining my interpretation of Mnuchin's comments this way. Um, Ten years ago, if you said you wanted to privatize the GSEs, you were anti-GSE. <laughs> now if you say you want to privatize the GSEs, you're apparently pro-GSE. <laughs> <laughs> so it's certainly been an interesting change uh, in the dynamic. Um, I believe Mnuchin is more in the ten years ago where when he talks about privatizing the GSEs, he's talking about having these companies look like every other company, uh, except for the autos, which of course will continue to bail out in the future. <laughs> um, but that said, I really think he's trying to get this beyond the bailout. I do not believe he is talking about going to just a pre-conservatorship model. Uh, and let me end with saying, you know, pivoting off of, of, of Rick's comment and your, your first question. I mean, the way I think about the division in the caucus is um, I think there's largely a pro-business side of the caucus, and I think there's largely a pro-market side of the caucus. And the difference between that is the pro-market side says, Markets and capitalism don't work without failure. You screw up, you go out of business. The pro-business side, of course, says businesses are so important, housing is so important, that we need, and autos are so important, all of these things are so important. So to me, one of my great frustrations over the years is kind of hearing this um, argument about it's really the big banks versus Fannie or Freddie. No, the people who are opposed to TARP are the people who are opposed to banning out Fannie and Freddie. The people who supported the TARP are the people who support bailing out Fannie and Freddie. It's, it's, it's really not a bank versus GSC. So to me, I think you have to look at it that way. Uh, and to me, there's not a lot of commonality in these perspectives. And so there's still half of the caucus who looks at this and says, you know, we shouldn't be bailing this out. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be bailing out Fannie and Freddie any more than we should have the XM Bank or any more than we should, you know, have Tree or Flunge or any of these subsidies. Sarah, can I add something Absolutely. to that for the, um, I guess, expectation of if the, the Senate will take this up or if it will get done? <laughs> it's like you have to remember, they have how many confirmations they have to go through at the beginning part of this year. They have health care. <laughs> they have, right? I mean, they have tax reform. There's a lot of big things out there that they want to work on. I don't think GSE reform is in their top five, you know, maybe even top seven. <laughs> so I think we, we could work towards... Uh, you know, getting the right thing, you know, out there for everyone to look at and start, you know, talking about. But I personally don't think it's realistic. I think the financial um, reform, I think we're going to talk about in a few, but I think that's more realistic. Um, and so let me just ask for people, Michael, you probably, this is going to add to your PSD. <laughs> um, one of the reasons that the legislative reform got stalled was that there was not a clear consensus even amongst uh, Democrats on what the affordable housing provisions that they hoped would be part of a legislative package would look like. And the lack of clarity about that meant that um, there was no ability to kind of come to a table because you didn't even know what you were dealing with. Is that set of considerations still at all important to whether a, a deal finally gets over the table, is that not relevant anymore? The Senate is yeah. still an institution where every senator has an important role to play. So thoughts about yeah. that? It, it's, no, it's, it's going to be critical. I think it's going to be critical for a number of reasons. I, I understand that we're split tonight in terms of looking back and looking forward, but I, I do think that this is an issue that hopefully lends itself to a bipartisan solution. I think that that was what we wanted. That's what we tried to do in 2013 and 2014. I think that, um, you know, if there's a legacy that came out of the bill that I'm most proud of, I think that, that that's for sure it. Um, in fact, the, the legislation almost stopped becoming about 
housing reform and started becoming about showing that you can actually sit across the table from someone who you disagree with and hammer out a compromise on the myriad of issues that you have to deal with and how uh, in something like housing finance reform and, and so the, I guess the point is yes it still matters to a lot of a lot of folks um, be because it matters to Democrats and it matters to Republicans too but you need a bipartisan solution the other thing is uh, the duty to serve rules there's a lot of about rural communities which are a lot of Republican states and so um, yeah I think um, figuring out how to have a system that relies on private capital but ensures broad access as safe as possible and what the push-pull between those regulations and rules and all that stuff are I mean I, I think that it's going to be absolutely the linchpin as to whether or not it happens or not any other observations? Yeah. So I think it took Republicans a long time to figure out that the housing goal constituency and the trust fund constituency are not the same. Mm. And there really was this sense among Republicans after it's like, I mean, to be blunt about it, the attitude was, okay, you tell us the number you want, mm. we'll write the check, and let's move on. And there really was this sense of, and you want more now? So, you know, I think there was this real frustration. And again, I think the Republican perspective initially was it, they're just negotiating with the same group that wants to go back and forth. And there really was not this recognition that these really are two different constituencies. And uh, I would argue it wasn't only the Republicans who had took a while to, 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 learn, to, to make that observation. Um, so uh, if we could for a moment, just sticking on uh, the GSEs, uh, we had in the earlier panel a discussion about uh, administrative authorities and how uh, uh, GSE reform, if not, gets over the finish line through administrative activities. Um, we think of it as building blocks get developed, ideas, intellectual ideas get developed. And you've seen that with uh, the common securitization platform. You've seen that with discussions uh, around risk sharing and to some extent with the rulemaking around GSC reform, at least that a lot of ideas got into the public discussion and people engaged around them and have learned a lot over the last few years. Um, if Sean is right, that uh, probably expecting the signing ceremony in April for GSC reform <laughs> is uh, uh, unduly optimistic. Um, Which April? <laughs> yeah. April 19th. Uh, 2023. Yeah. Um, uh, that's what Lori's betting on, right? <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, um, is, I think FHFA's role in uh, continuing to advance this discussion in this next period, anyone want to share any thoughts? I would say, I mean, if, if, uh, if you look at the political landscape, and I agree beyond what Sean has said, you've got a budget resolution, you've got a debt ceiling, <laughs> um, you've got an infrastructure bill, you've got the tax bill. I mean, you've got a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of political capital that's got to be invested. One, and you've got somebody who has got a five-year term who's from the other party, as you know, Mel Watt at FHFA, who may or, or may not be in sync with what the administration wants to do. But if, if that person was, you certainly could do some things at FHFA that began to incrementally move closer to the model that you wanted to get to so that when you ultimately ended up with a legislative decision, it wasn't as large a leap as it, as it might otherwise be. And if you were also of a mind that you wanted to reduce the federal footprint, but you want to do it in a responsible, cautious way and assess whether or not the consequences of that were what you expected to be, you could you could do that through FHFA, pot potentially through loan limits. I know there's some question around that, G fees and some other areas. But who steps in at that point? I mean, there's no private market right now. I mean, what, what, until I think we have a bright line of an explicit guarantee or something, that yeah, there's no one else that's going to come in and... And last I checked, I don't know, can the bank balance sheets handle everything? Absolutely. Can they? I don't know. I just... Well, I mean, the excess reserves of the bank... Yeah. You can fund the mortgage market for the next two years of excess reserves that banks hold. Okay. Well, I'm just... Like, I, there's no private market that's going to come in, so... It's well, that's a nice uh, segue, actually, to my next set of questions, which is around FHA reform. Um, there seems to be a uh, general sense from all sides everywhere that something about FHA needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. That's sort of, if you don't ask the next question, you can get consensus that far. 
Um, but again, even within Republican voices, there are probably some very different mm -hmm. models of what FHA reform might look like. Everything from something that has it pulling back in some ways uh, to a tighter market to things that are more about making FHA uh, uh, work in ways that provide more clarity so that the business, if you will, the, the housing industry itself finds it more amenable to work with. And either of those could be seen as sort of a pro-business approach uh, to, or a, a Republican-like approach to FHA reform. Um, and this question is not unrelated to the question of what you're imagining uh, the GSC market. Because what we saw is when the GSEs right. uh, shrank their market share, FHA's market share, whatever your intentions were, the, the taxpayers were on the hook directly or th uh, in one level back through the FHA Guarantee Fund. So how do you think FHA uh, on its own and in connection with GSE reform is likely to be part of the conversation? I'll invite anyone who wants to start, but Sean, maybe you should. Yeah. Um, well, there's a few things. There's, there's two separate things really with FHA reform. One is, as a lender, I mean, systems go down for weeks at times, and no matter if you're originating what they're originating today or one loan a year, you need to have, they need some technology money. They need to get up to, you know, close to where we are now with technology because you can't, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not good. And I'm sure all of you know that, all the lenders All of us who have our <laughs> FHA yeah. alumni in the room yes. sort of can, can yes, relate. But, um, yeah. But um, then there's, you know, why did FHA balloon? I mean, the, the private label market went away, right? You had the, uh, the Alt-A, and we talked on the earlier panel that it's lower credit scores. I mean, I, I beg to differ because you have jumbo FHAs, and I think you really got to look at the fund and see what's in there. But um, it's, um, it, FHA reform needs to be part of a bigger picture. And, and this is my own thought, okay, it's no one else's, I didn't, it's not the transition, it's not, it's not um, Quicken Loans, it's my own thought of just the stuff I've been thinking about. What if we had like one regulator out there where all of housing was under there? You had VA, you had Rural, you had FHA, you had Fannie Freddie. Do we need both Fannie and Freddie? I mean, I think we really need to go deep and look at all of those things. Are, are they the, just products underneath or programs underneath that, that we need to do from a, from a government standpoint to back? Um, I mean, housing is important. Rental rates are ridiculous in America, and people can't even rent a home. It's it's they're higher than, you know, it's it's cheaper to buy a home today, and it's 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 you know we got to balance all of that. So, I don't know. That's something I've been thinking about, and it's um it's something I think we should look at. And FHA, yes, reform needs to be part of a bigger picture because you can't just say raise your um you know risk based price over at Fannie and Freddie, and then everything heads over to FHA. So. so I definitely want us to come back to rental housing. It's not going to be the last five minutes of this panel, Carol, I assure you. But other thoughts on FHA? I would say the two, two things that I would look at would be whether or not you could re-examine the application of the Fair Claims Act. Um, False, False Claims, Claims Act. False, False Claims, Claims Act. Um, you know, how does that, FHA is actually has a, has a, taxonomy, a taxonomy of the, um, uh, various defects, and if you could you could bucket them in whatever three yeah, or they four pro buckets. They propose yeah. some stuff, yeah. But but to sort of have some visibility in terms of liability, so that you get the larger regulated banks back in the FHA business. I think that's something to look at. The other issue I would say, which is related to that, because as the larger well-capitalized banks have 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 retreated from the FHA market, um, I think it raises certain questions around servicers, the quality of the servicers that are being used, whether or not they uh, have the financial wherewithal in a, in a crisis to be able to follow through, which obviously we saw in the last crisis that that was a, a problem. And then FHA itself in terms of the rules around conveyances, foreclosures, how long it takes, you know, it's sort of a, a, the servicing rules are expensive and complicated and difficult. Um, and that ought to be something else I think that we ought to look at. And th there, there are certainly some things I think that can be, can be done to help address those issues. And to add what, what Brooks said, I'm sorry, Mark. No, right um, the FHA servicing rules are very difficult for, uh, for, to your point that servicers can't service. I mean, because they're put in a difficult position to, have to the way they have to service loans and the rules they have to follow. 
Other observations on FHA? Well, before I make an observation on FHA, I, I do want to emphasize that there are regulatory components, regulatory components of this out of Dodd-Frank, such as the qualified mortgage and the residential qualified mortgage rule that seriously need to be rethought. If I could uh, quote my friend Dave Stevens, he likes to say that every mortgage file has an error. Mm -hmm. We will find out during the next downturn under QM how many of those errors are material and how many of those errors will therefore be a bar to foreclosure. So there's a lot of uncertainty over how much you will be able to foreclose. And I guess only the economists can get away with saying this, which is the socially optimal amount of foreclosures is not zero. <laughs> uh, and us striving toward that will reduce the credit box, and it has reduced the credit box. So if you're telling me as a lender, I'm not sure that you'll ever be able to collect on this loan if it goes bad, well, yeah, I'm going to have a really tight credit box, and that's the case. And of course, in the QRM, you know, it is a nightmare for anybody except securities lawyers. You have, you know, 10-5-B uh, fraud liability under that anytime it goes wrong. You don't know what the lines are. So again, the legal liability and risk with QRM and QM is very, very real and needs to be addressed, in my opinion. But to FHA, um, so, you know, maybe this is going to be a radical thing to say, but I like to think after the last decade we have learned housing prices do indeed go down. And they will indeed go down again. Uh, and it's a radical thing to suggest. Um, Ian, to me, the book of FHA, most of the subprime basically went into FHA. Half of the book of FHA they, is by any definition subprime. It will not perform well in the next downturn. And one of the things that concerns me is with the loan limit increases, I mean, like, I think God, when we went into the last crisis, that FHA essentially had almost no footprint in California. Now, massive exposure to California. That's not going to turn out pretty. And the driver of reform for FHA is going to be having to make very large appropriations to cover those losses, particularly in places like California. Michael? Yeah, I mean, I'd say two things. Number one, the point about FHA needing more resources. You know, when you, when you issue a Gini security and you have to get FHA insurance, I mean, you can get USDA or VA, but use FHA as an example, there's a true up process where Gini and FHA make sure that they know the same loan and the same loan balance. When there's a discrepancy, FHA literally sends you a letter in the mail with a list of the loans. And I know this because I was a recipient of one of them in 2015, and it was sent to the wrong address. And so for nine months, we were in violation of FHA without even knowing because no one had called. We didn't even have a dedicated account rep. So FHA needs more resources. And then this, Ginny too, but FHA for sure. The, and the, the other thing uh, is that I, uh, your point is interesting, but I would take from it that all this political prognosticating that we do can change on a dime. And so, um, you know, we all do tend to, it's human nature, it's, it, it, we do it in a lot of aspects of life, but sort of assume that we're going to extrapolate based off the, tra the trajectory that we're on. So, you know, I predict, you know, I can make all these predictions about housing reform, FHA reform, the ecosystem that we live in and the changes we're going to make to it. I can also just as likely tell you that there are going to be exogenous events that we do not see here that are going to cause or be impetus to some sort of action. And potentially, that's the only way we're going to get to immediate action on this issue. And so we don't know what those events are going to be. We don't know uh, um, what the downstream implications of them will be. We hope that good pe policymakers of, you know, good intellect and good, good faith and good character are there at the time to be able to handle the situation, but there's going to be things that we can't predict and it's going to spur actions that we can't predict right now. Sarah, can I have one more thing for FHA reform? Whatever we do, we can't just look at a spreadsheet or a budget and just cut and say, oh, this is going to fix it. We need to go deep and really understand what is happening behind the scenes because these letters that go out, how many more things are there like that right. that you could save tons of money by just fixing that or, or putting, you know, I don't know. It, it, I'm sure there's tons of stuff. Any company has process people, and um, I'm sure you go deep on this stuff all the time. But I, I just hope that we don't just look at an MMI fund and say, oh, let's do this because of this. We need to go deep and really understand. And also, with a budget, you can't just say, oh, let's take $3 billion off or whatever a number is that Congress wants to do. And you need to understand what you're cutting and what you're doing. So one of my uh, businesses observations regarding FHA is that whoever the incoming FHA commissioner is needs to have someone at their side who is really knowledgeable about the arcane federal budget rules because you would think that if you spent a dime you could uh, save a dollar in federal insurance programs that that wouldn't be difficult to do 
but in the arcanity of the way the Federal Credit Reform Act works and HUD's administrative appropriation caps for its administrative spending, those two things overlap with one another and create some very bizarre incentives I mean, about really spending. Really, ultimately, I mean, since the staffing and admin is paid for by appropriated dollars rather than premium dollars, I mean, we really should be moving to a unified world where you can charge premium to pay for admin. Uh, and again, I agree, agree. It's ridiculous the, the current. What about down. setting up like a private equity company, like a management fee, <sighs> and then you get that to run the business? That's that's an issue too, and of course you've got the the, the FTE caps that any department I'm just saying, is you subject know, to. Yeah. Is a is a former Shelby staffer okay with an off appropriated source <laughs> of? <laughs> I'm. <laughs> I'm this is being recorded? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Broadcasted I'm, uh, to the I, internet. I'm supportive of giving FHA flexibility in exchange for FHA charging premium income to pay for its admin expenses, which are currently I, I appropriate agree. enough. All right, yeah. everyone, got, we got it on the record, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carol's doing the, 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 the end zone dance over there. We're solving problems. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I do, Carol's but I promised back. that we would talk about rental housing for a few minutes, so let us try to do that as well. Um, uh, I, the first panel uh, talked a little bit about this. We do find, uh, on the one hand, we have a world in which fewer people expect and maybe wish to be homeowners, at least in the first part of uh, their life. We also have fewer people able to be homeowners if they choose to be right now, and that is housing market issues as well as broader issues of uh, income stability and economic mobility. Um, but as a result, there's enormous demand for the rental stock and a big mismatch between what incomes will support uh, and the cost of the housing stock in many places, although that picture that I just described varies dramatically. Uh, Trump country, if some would call it that, uh, are places that at least some analyses I've seen suggest have seen actually uh, sort of less financial instability than some of uh, the, the central cities have seen, um, which have sort of bigger polar ends of different experiences of different uh, parts of the population, um, including uh, less house price um, uh, instability, meaning that prices didn't fall as far, but also a lot less house price appreciation, which means that they have not felt that they benefited from the benefits of the recovery that they saw other places uh, benefiting from. So you've got a lot of different um, uh, rental housing demand pictures in different places, but you know the size of the crisis is quite significant. You have a lot of people who are paying enormous shares of their income at the bottom end of the income spectrum for housing. Uh, again, we talked about diversities of views within the Republican Party. There is uh, uh, been a strand of the Republican Party that you could call Paul Ryan and Jack Kemp and others that have spent a lot of time trying to think about solutions for that end of the market, uh, but with market-oriented approaches. Uh, and then there are others who believe we should let the market work its way. Um, can you give us some thoughts about what we're likely to see in the debate around rental housing coming forward, Rick? So, I sort of just start off by saying there's not a state in America where there's less than 37 percent of the renters that are not rent burdened. Every state, rural, urban, east, west, north, south. Uh, we have about 12 million families now that pay more, renters that pay more than 50 percent of their income in rent. It's been increasing. Uh, you can't build a new two-bedroom two apartment, thousand square foot apartment, and and make it available to rent to a, a working per person who's got minimum wage, almost two incomes at minimum wage. They, they wouldn't be able to afford that. So this problem isn't getting better on its own, and it's not just an urban issue. I remember one presidential candidate early in the primary season, I was talking to him about this, and I said, yeah, we said, well, what are they all in California, New York? They said, no, they're actually in places like New Hampshire and South Carolina and <laughs> Iowa. I said, what's your cell phone number? <laughs> um, so uh, it, it's, a, it's a real and growing problem, and it, it has been a problem through recessions and recoveries and expansions. That's the reality. Um, and there's lots of reasons for it, which we probably don't have time to discuss from you know, both demand and supply issues. There are, are m members of Congress where that doesn't s 
they don't hear about it. It's not something that people, the reason why they call it a silent crisis is nobody's standing on their doorstep to scream out and say, I had to forego my child's inhaler uh, because I had to pay 60% of my income in rent or my car broke down and I lost my job. And so nobody's talking, they don't, people don't talk about that. And so they don't hear about it at town hall meetings. People don't generally broadcast it. They don't generally have lead articles in newspapers or lead stories in the local media about these things. And so it doesn't have the political energy of, of some other issues. But I think Republicans have a growing awareness of the challenge and that it's not going away on its own. And you see people like Paul Ryan talking about a poverty agenda. Um, and the need to address it through education and training. I mean, they'll always be part of the population because they're elderly or because they're disabled that we are in a caretaker mode. And we just need to be able to do that responsibly. There's another part of the population that w have the ability to work and want to work and we need to help create an environment where they can exercise their free will to work. Um, and so that's, that's where I think Republicans are focusing and some leading voices are focusing and housing has got to be part of that discussion. I, I, you know, I'll play, it's not devil's advocate, but I'm making a point that others have done research on that I think is an in interesting set of research, which is uh, to say that, um, you know, there's a, there's a line of thought that says, <clears throat> saying that Washington, sh we shouldn't all be up in arms of trying to fix this, isn't the same as saying the market should just work because some of the impediments to affordable rental are local zoning laws, right? So, so you have capacity limits and you have park rules around how much parking you can have. And it, you, know, you do make it difficult to build uh, affordable units um, because of a lot of the local zoning laws and that you know, uh, attempts at subsidies maybe drive up the price or get monetized in the, in the price of rent. There is research to suggest that that is a part of the challenge. Okay, Absolutely. So, okay, so that's just, that's one and, thing. And I might observe that increasingly you see advocates on the left and right making that same point, slightly for different reasons. One sort of pursuing a more inclusionary uh, approach and the other just simply concerned about the burden on development. But in either, Kent, there's an interesting coalition of perspectives. It's yeah. hard for the feds to have a lot to do about that. Right. And so I, I think that I, I make this point to say that when we look for a solution to this crisis, which is a crisis in my mind, um, we do need to recognize that um, we have to get outside of the 495 Beltway in order to solve it. It's going to involve a lot of field study. It's going to involve a lot of local uh, attempts at you know, trial and error and trying different programs and seeing how it can work. But I do think this is a moral crisis. I mean, I think that it doesn't, it's not even captured in statistics. So the fact that a third of renters are paying more than 50% to rent, you're not even capturing in that the fact that these folks are probably traveling a very long distance to get to work. They're not spending time with their families. You know, this, this, it's, it's deeper, I think, than even the numbers suggest. And so it has to be addressed. And so we need to fix the holistic answer. I mean, the, wash, the, the subsidy component, which we can do here, and we do, uh, the local zoning problems, I mean, it, it has to be part of the, we have to solve this problem, because it's, it's, it's not okay that this continues. And I, um, one of you mentioned uh, rural housing. Um, and although um, the problems of affordability are there, they may be a little less extreme. The problems of housing, of st uh, substandard housing, the problems of housing that have access to employment and opportunities and quality education and other things are a very big piece of it. One uh, Republican staffer said to me recently something to the effect of, you all come in and talk about housing in the big cities, that's not where any of our members are from. Um, so how do we start to talk about rural housing in this crisis as a way of engaging some of those members? Sarah, can I add to the FHA? Sure. I didn't know you were moving on, I'm sorry. Okay. I have like a crazy idea, and again, this is my own thought, <laughs> and, w and it's to do with rental, but we pay, I mean, and I don't even know if there's enough houses in America to, to do this, but people are spending 50, 60 percent. We're helping people subsidize their rental right on the government section eight affordable house whatever it might be a fraction of those yeah, yeah i mean yeah and so what if we gave them a grant of some sort they of course they'd have to go through some kind of process to prove that they can you know own a home and all that stuff and we put that grant on the end because that's the hardest thing for someone to get out of a rental right is to save the money to for the down payment what if we helped them with that got them off of 
us, the government, supplementing their rental income, and then they become a homeowner. Mm. Again, it's not going to be for everybody, but just a, some some different ways to look at things. But Put it on the back end when they sell their home, and then you know it comes back into a fund, whatever it might be. We actually have something that's relatively s small model on this, but it allows vouchers to be converted for down payment right. assistance and housing assistance, which you make which it bigger. We, yeah, you, you could potentially scale that up. <coughs> yeah, mm -hmm. but that's not going to be the solution. I mean, when you have only one out of four people are eligible for Section 8 vouchers are actually getting it. It means you have three out of four that are mm -hmm. either on a waiting list that's so long they're not going to get to them in years or they're closed, the wait list is closed. And there's something that's fundamentally wrong about that too. Right. That how do, you, how do you think about how to manage a limited amount of money so that um, you're touching people in serious need? So, um, because I want to make sure we get a nice closing round, I'm going to uh, uh, turn to um, uh, first just talk about budget. So let me ask Rick and Michael to talk just briefly, if you would, about uh, funding. We're likely to see federal budgets that are far more significantly constrained. Um, and that means that uh, resources for the federal housing programs we have, which already, as we talked about, meet only a share of the existing affordable housing need, are likely to be further constrained or be subject to limitations. We have challenges of the impact of tax reform on the low-income housing tax credit, which is essentially our only effective uh, production, production program. Mm -hmm. um, so if you would make any observations and predictions about uh, how the conversation we were just having relates to budget. And Sean and Mark, I'm going to turn to you back about Dodd-Frank and uh, some related issues before we close. Okay. So the challenge for HUD, which is about a $48 billion appropriations um, appropriate department, is that five of the programs, the project-based choice vouchers, CDBG, Homeless, and McKinney, I guess, are the five, maybe it's public housing, I'm sorry, operating capital, they're consuming about 86% of the budget. The two Section 8 programs, about two-thirds of the budget, and they're effectively an autopilot. I mean, they're increasing every year and they're slowly cannibalizing the ability of HUD to have the kind of impact that I think people would love to see them have. And it's a, it's a huge challenge to what is HUD supposed to be when you have a department that's in this position. The, the way out of the box, as I see it, is, is, is through outside of you know, something else that happens where you have money freed up is really to do a much better job of understanding that no community and no family lives in silos. That you have, you have to develop a, a federal model, which is excruciatingly difficult, I grant you that, to, to leverage the healthcare dollars, the public safety dollars, the education dollars, the Department of Labor dollars, and help create these in, in synergistic environments where where communities can make it, where you have a single supernova. No city mayor wants to go through different application processes, different deadlines. It's maddening. If you could get to the point where we had more of those um, sort of opportunity to work programs expanded in a cross-disciplinary way, that might be a way forward. You're talking about pay for success models as well, tapping? Uh, potentially, that's another piece of it, yeah. but I. You know, there, there are some interesting things done, done on the healthcare side, for example, in terms of Medicaid waivers, moving people out of hospitals and skilled nursing facilities into permanent housing with supportive services, which the resident loves, and it's saving millions of dollars. Right now, it's only <coughs> available for states that will use their local, their state match as opposed to the federal match. As they build data, and we ought to be very data-driven about this, and we can prove the point, we ought to be more flexible on that. Michael, any other observations about budget? You know, uh, it's not my area of expertise. I, I never worked on appropriations or budget committee. I, I, I'd much rather talk about the likelihood of Dodd Frank. All right, well then I'll let you do that. <laughs> okay. So I, I will make one. I'll make one point. Since we've made an agreement that uh, our housing agencies should have the budgetary authority to charge and, and have control over those resources, I, I do think that that would be a critical step. I think both Ginny and uh, FHA are constrained. Um, by the appropriations process, and if they had the ability to charge a basis point or two, they have a sizable net portfolio, they really could upgrade everything. It could actually do. be a Nixon goes to China moment because that was very hard to get Republican appropriators to ever do with Democratic uh, HUD staff. I actually think this would be an interesting 
moment when it might be possible. Sir, if I could, because I don't think we ever answered your rural question. Yeah, no, you did Because I think That's it's fair. important. I, I do want to flesh this out. So one of the last things I worked on before I left the hill is a reauthorization of the Kitty Vento homelessness programs. And you know, it's not unsurprising, rural homelessness looks a whole lot different than urban homelessness. Rural homelessness is much more family sleeping in a barn somewhere. And the amount of fighting we had over the definitions, not only fighting with HUD, who did not want to. So I also had, I believe in the late 90s, there was a rural homelessness program set up under McKinney Vento. HUD refused to ever issue rules. This is a Republican HUD that we yelled at consistently to have them issue rules to deal with rural homelessness. And so again, we really fought and put a lot of effort to expand the definition to cover family homelessness in a way so that rural areas would be involved. And this is just an example where we constantly were getting this you know, we only want this money for this version of what's going on in central cities. Mm. Uh, and to maybe end with that, you know, last time I looked, approximately one in four HUD dollars goes to California and New York. There really is this perspective from a lot of Republicans of, we are constantly told that this is a department that doesn't send money to our constituents and don't dare try to do that. And that, I think, is a really big problem in terms of if you want to build a bipartisan consensus for this department, there has to be a sense of bipartisan benefit, and it's not there. There's so much to mine in that, but I'm going to <laughs> turn to Dodd Frank instead. Um, now you got Mark's PTSD. Yeah, exactly. So he, yeah, he got excited about that. He's not going to be uh, as excited, excited about, excited about Dodd, Dodd Frank. Frank. Yeah, All right. Okay, good. Good. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. to, so actually, Sean, this is a great way to start this. Um, to a significant extent, Dodd-Frank is built in, I mean, there's been, uh, you know, probably billions of economic dollars expended <laughs> into figuring out how to implement a set of existing regulations. There is great political opportunity in talking about repeal of large swaths of federal regulatory policy. But the cost uh, of doing that, I could imagine, to firms is terrifying. Um, so how do you imagine both an incoming administration and the Congress sort of wrestling with the desire to uh, uh, deal with some of the aspects of the law that are unpopular without reinventing the economic? We heard Phyllis talking about every time they tweaked HAMP, there was a huge economic cost to doing so. And Phil's brought up a great point. Like HAMP, like at least got the phone call made. If someone even didn't get a HAMP, you know, modification, they got some other modification. So it was good for that. Um, with Dodd Frank, I mean, honestly, guys, I think we need to, again, my opinion, move on, fix everything that you know we could fix. Trid. I mean, there's ways to make Trid. Put an opt out in if someone doesn't want to do the three day or whatever seven day, ten day, whatever days it is, wh whatever point in the process you are. Fix QM. Make it so that um, lenders don't feel like they're on the on the hook for everything. Fix. Um, um, God, what are some other things we could fix? There's tons of things we could fix. But then let's focus on the housing market and use our energies there. I mean, I think Jeb's Financial Choice Act bill is a very good start. I mean, he's fixing QM, he's fixing the 3%, he's fixing, he's got tons of things in there that I think would, would make everyone happy. Then they can focus on the CFPB separately because that's going to be a whole argument in itself. And then we can focus on housing reform. Other uh, my thoughts. Uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll go back to where I said earlier about there being essentially a pro-business and a pro-market caucus. Let me really emphasize the pro-market Republican caucus sincerely and honestly looks at Dodd-Frank as a permanent bailout mechanism through the orderly resolution process, which quite frankly, if you read the language, it's very clear you can rescue creditors in that. So to me, there's no argument about whether you can do it or not. The argument is, will you? Uh, and so there really is this sense that we didn't deal with what caused the financial crisis, and instead we made it a lot worse. And that is a seer belief that is not politically driven. Now, on the other hand, I accept that most of the banks look at this. I mean, let's keep in mind, uh, you know, the orderly resolution process of Title II looks a whole lot like a proposal that Jamie Dimon wrote in 2009. I don't think that's a coincidence, quite frankly. And so I understand that the industry wants something different. It's also important to keep in mind, and this is where, to me, the real interesting back and forth will go, because so far, the Trump administration has come in and really relied on a lot of New Yorkers. Um, from the sort of Henserling, Crapo, Shelby approach, they don't give a damn about city. What they care about is SunTrust. What they care about is regions. 
that care about is PNC. They care about the big, who they look at is these large regional banks that are not too big to fail, that will not be getting bailed out, but get stuck with the blame because we had the bailout city. And there really is this very big division within the party uh, and it's not as simply, oh, they're going to do whatever Wall Street thinks. It really is a driven by a concern for the Main Street banks having to pay for the sins of Wall Street. So let us, on any of the issues that we have talked about in the last 50 minutes, ask each of you to share, not a should, but a prediction. What is one thing that you think may change in the next two years that might surprise people or um, might uh, where there's possibility for policy to happen um, that people should be, we like to talk about skating to where the puck is going to be, mm. <laughs> readying our analytic work to be informing the debates that are happening. What are some of the things that you think may be moving in the next two years? Who wants to go first? I'll All right, I'll start. I, I, I think there's a good chance that there will be a plus up for the tax credit to compensate for the effect of lower rates. Um, so I'd say that would be that's one, thing, one thing to look, <laughs> to look for. I do think that there'll be more of this effort to try and have an, an interagency approach to s solving some of these community issues, some of these problems. Um, so I think those are, those are two things. And I, I think the two issues that I talked about on the FHA side will receive attention and, and we'll, you'll see results as a result of that. Sean? <laughs> the Financial Choice Act. I think that's good. Or is that what it's called? The Choice Act? Choice Act yeah, yeah, I think that'll get done. That's about all I'm willing to. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mean I, so I do think we're likely to see very modest Dodd-Frank reform. So the framework stays, CFPB stays, and that, you know, you have some tweaks here and there. The tweaks that are, that are actually are important, uh -huh. that I don't see as surprising. Uh, what I'll do is go out and make, here's the surprising prediction to me, which is, um, after about six months of a Republican director at CFPB, suddenly Democrats go back to their original position of thinking a board is a great ideal. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I don't think any changes to the CFPB will ever pass the Senate. Um, but I do think, my bold prediction is that in both housing and financial services policy, there is going to be, over the next four years, um, meaningful bipartisan legislation passed. Several pieces of meaningful bipartisan legislation. And we have an opportunity, and I do think we'll take, take advantage of it, to have uh, a more constructive bipartisan dialogue on the issues that the folks in this room care about. Um, and not a prediction, but a hope on my part, which is that I think the one really positive, um, and it's not much, uh, fallout of the crisis in the housing world is that there was a beginning uh, to be a translation function that began to be played between the capital markets and sort of, if you think of it as the expertise in the treasury building and the consumer and community sets of considerations where people like Lori and others, but also capacities developed in HUD and at treasury uh, and to some extent in the White House to understand these issues uh, and so that the different expertises could be at the table and I hope that whatever officials end up occupying those roles, that kind of community of shared knowledge and expertise helps to guide the policy making. I think we uh, in this room would all like to be part of a conversation that um, uh, was informing a kind of shared learning that brings capital markets and consumers together. Um, I'm going to say thank you to panel and ask Lori to close us out, but please first join me in thanking Ms. Griffith. Well, I'd like to th um, thank all of our panelists from both sessions. It's been incredible to hear from those that were on the front lines managing our way out of the crisis and those that are now going to be setting the stage for the next four years. So thanks again for, to all of our panelists. Thanks to all of you for um, being here tonight. We are absolutely overwhelmed by the size of the crowd. Um, we hope to you know, continue the conversations that we've started tonight. Thanks, as always, um, to those who provide funding support, particularly the Housing, Forum and, uh, Housing Finance Innovation Forum, the individuals and firms that provide the flexible funding that lets us do this, these events, as well as our other um, 
research that we on issues that we think are important. Um, I'll certainly be pondering what I've heard tonight. From the first panel, I ended up with a real sense of appreciation of what it meant to be in the midst of the crisis, the difficulties of navig navigating the markets in the midst of the crisis with no playbook, with, criticize, with criticism from all sides. You're not doing enough. You're doing too much. And for one who said, gee, you, you're not doing enough, um, I really had a sense of appreciation from what, you know, sort of how, how these guys looked at it. And in the end, they got it right. I mean, you know, yes, this didn't work on the first, uh, you know, um, HAMP wasn't as successful as it could have been on the first try, so you modify it, you modify it, you modify it. Um, but modifications, you know, the whole modification technology has left a permanent um, stamp on the way we look at the mortgage process. Um, I think we all, um, I think, the, you know, the elevation of, the, of multifamily was really important. Everyone agrees the unfinished business was GSC reform, which is where the second panel started. Um, there's a real sense that it's not, certainly, you know, as Sean said, it's not in the top five. There are a lot of other really important issues ahead of it. I think uh, Michael Bright was, uh, you know, optimistic that sometime in the next um, four years we'd get some sort of consensus, and certainly the process to date has moved us a little bit closer to that. The one thing that was actually very, very heartening was the overall consensus and the need to, for FHA reform on things that could be done, that is, more money for systems, greater flexibility using program money, um, to pay for some of this flexibility, the prospect of moving forward um, in terms of um, eliminating the burden of the False Claims Act, um, making the conveyance process um, and the whole FHA servicing um, more friendly, and certainly these are issues that we're going to be focusing on. The rental housing discussion was very interesting in the fact, in the sense that there is no, there's a. A everyone agreed that it was a huge problem with no easy solution, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of the solutions are um, on the, you know, on the local level, um, including the difficulties in building. And on Dodd-Frank, there was some optimism that we would be able to fix some of the issues, um, but, it, um, but it would actually, but certainly not all of them, and that the scope for um, the rollback was less than what many people had thought. So um, that was kind of what I took away from this. I hope, I'm sure, you know, everyone took away a lot. And again, I want to thank the panelists for um, doing a fabulous job. And I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. And for those of you that want to mingle for a few minutes, um, feel free to do so. <laughs>